Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. This is Rocket Science, and today we've got several developments to catch up on. This is the final go no go pull for Starship. Hey, bye, two. Go. Stage one. Go. Stage two. Go. Flight directors, go for launch. The Starliner spacecraft is still docked with the ISS, but it won't be returning with its crew. Software is being loaded to bring it back autonomously, and it will return to Earth on its own on the 6th of September. The reason for this is well known. The Starliner program has been plagued with delays and malfunctions, covered in depth in several of our lessons. Now NASA has decided that the helium leaks and thruster malfunctions on this mission makes its crude operation unsafe. Astronauts Wilmore and Williams will be coming home on a SpaceX Dragon crew capsule in February of 2025 with Expedition 7172 crew. When they launch, they know that there are circumstances where they can be on board for up to a year. I know this is a huge impact um, to their families, and it means a lot. Despite the series of problems with the Boeing Starliner capsule, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson says it will carry astronauts again in future missions. Now understand that most likely, Starliner will return to Earth intact. And I would argue that returning on Starliner would probably have been safer than the astronauts driving their cars from their homes to the launch complex in the first place. The reason I said that Starliner was unsafe is because these astronauts have dedicated their lives to the exploration of space. Ignoring known threats to their safety is how we lost Challenger in Columbia. The Starliner continues to have unexpected faults. I agree with sending it back on its own, but I also think we need to cancel the program. Boeing does not deserve another chance or any more billions of taxpayer dollars. Let's help Sierra Nevada buy ULA and get the Vulcan and Dream Chaser going instead. It would be a lot faster and cheaper. And we need an alternative capsule. Throwing good money after bad is called the sunk cost fallacy, and it's never a good plan. SpaceX is, right now, our only way to get Americans to space, and this is not optimal. Even SpaceX can have problems, as a recent second stage failure and now a booster landing failure demonstrate. But it's important to keep perspective. Grounding the Falcon 9 rocket system over a booster landing failure is stupid in my opinion but something that is automatically done when a flying machine fails. No other company even tries to land boosters, so a mishap at this stage of flight operations does not affect the safety of crewed missions. Starship Integrated Test Flight 5 is scheduled for next month, and while I'm looking forward to seeing them try to catch a booster, it's important to remember that this is designed to be a throwaway rocket system. Flight 5 will use Raptor 2s on a version 1 Starship and booster. The operational Starship will be vastly different. The increased power of the Raptor 3, combined with its amazingly simplified design, is a testament to the fact that engineering at its pinnacle becomes art. We said we would look at the capabilities of a completed Raptor 3 Starship, so let's do that now. The Raptor 3 has a thrust of 280 tons of force right now, with 300 expected as the final performance metric. Now let's look at specific impulse. For the longest time, SpaceX had quoted a sea level specific impulse of 330 seconds, with a vacuum optimized efficiency of 380 seconds. So when they announced specific impulse of 350 seconds for Raptor 3, I assumed that was for the sea level version. If not at launch, then quickly after climbing to higher altitudes. Some corrected me that it's the vacuum version. If that's the case, our equations change. Because remember, when we do our calculations, these are estimates, it would take simulation software correcting for altitude and actual temperature to get an exact value. That's because when we look at the rocket equation, we see that it assumes a constant specific impulse. This will not be the case in atmosphere because the exhaust velocity which determines specific impulse, will improve as the atmosphere 
pushing back into the nozzle and reducing performance, starts to dissipate with increasing altitude. There are other factors, too, that must be considered. The booster right now is about 250 metric tons of dry mass, but that included heat shielding for the Raptor 2. That will not be necessary for the Raptor 3. That's because the cooling shroud now covers the entire engine. A brilliant solution. The Raptor 1, with hardware and shielding, had a total mass of 3,630 kilograms and a thrust of 185 metric tons. The Raptor 2 was 2,875 kilograms with a thrust of 230 metric tons. The Raptor 3 is 1,720 kilograms with a thrust of 280 metric tons right now. With 33 engines on the current booster and a planned 35 on the new version. 33 Raptor 2s at 2,875 kilograms gives us almost 95 metric tons of dry mass just for the engines and shielding. 35 Raptor 3s at 1,720 kilograms gives us just a little over 60 metric tons. That's a mass savings of about 35 metric tons with a 22% increase in thrust. Anyone looking at these metrics and claiming that the SpaceX Starship is destined to fail is denying reality. So the booster is going to drop from 250 to about 215 metric tons as soon as they update the engines. And that means the Starship will save mass too, with six of these new engines shaving off almost seven metric tons there also. What can we do if we use Raptor 3 engines at 300 tons force? With 35 engines producing 300 tons force each, we get a total thrust of 10,500 tons. We divide that by a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5 and get our launch mass of 7,000 metric tons. That's 2,000 metric tons or 40% more mass lifting off the ground than the current version. Now if we stretch the tanks, now if we stretch the tanks, we are going to bump up the dry mass. So let's estimate about how much that would be. If the current booster mass is 250 metric tons and 95 of that is the 33 Raptor 2s, then the other 155 is the tanks and other hardware. Now stretching the tanks by adding rings does not require us to add much more of the more massive hardware, like the thrust puck, separation hardware, and grid fins. Looking at the old design, with a booster propellant mass of 3,450 metric tons, and the Starship with 1,200, we get 69% of the total mass booster propellant, and 24% Starship propellant, with 2% being the planned 100 metric ton payload, and the residual 5% to dry mass. So let's go with 225 metric tons for the new booster with Raptor 3s and stretch tanks, and 125 metric tons for the Starship with a 150 metric ton payload. Let's apply that to our 7,000 metric ton launch mass and get a total of 6,500 metric tons of propellant. The old design had 74% of the propellant mass in the booster, and we'll do the same thing. That gives us 4,823 metric tons for booster propellant and 1,677 metric tons for the Starship. We'll keep 23 metric tons of propellant in the booster for boost back and landing reserve and let's say 17 metric tons for the Starship to deorbit and land, assuming a sea level efficiency of 330 second specific impulse. And we get an exhaust velocity of 3,237 meters per second. Now if we want, we can calculate mass propellant flow rate by turning 300 metric tons or 300,000 kilograms of force into the real units of force by multiplying by the force of gravity on Earth, 9.81 meters per second squared, and coming up with 2,943,000 newtons. Times 35 is 103,005,000 newtons. Divided by 3,237 meters per second gives us 31,818 kilograms per second mass propellant flow. So every second this new booster is firing at full thrust, we go through over 30 metric tons of propellant, almost 32. We launch at a total mass of 7,000 metric tons and burn through 4,800 metric tons of propellant. That leaves us with a delta V of 3,746. The Starship hot stages, firing its engines, and the booster separates with its 225 metric tons of dry mass and 23 metric tons of reserve propellant leaving a new initial mass of 1,952 metric tons for the Starship. It burns 1,660 metric tons of propellant, leaving 17 metric tons in reserve. 
And now if we assume a specific impulse of 350 seconds, we can get an exhaust velocity of 3,434 meters per second. And this achieves a delta V of 6,524 meters per second. That gives us a total delta V of 10,270 meters per second, meaning we could actually increase our payload. Now, if we get to the goal of 380 second specific impulse and vacuum, we get 3,728 meters per second for the exhaust velocity and increase our delta V to 7,083 for a total of 10,829 meters per second. We can actually increase our payload to 250 metric tons, dropping our Starship propellant mass by the 100 metric ton difference and still achieve a delta V of 9,728 meters per second. It takes about 9,400 to get safely into orbit at 7,800 meters per second once you subtract gravity drag and air drag, so this is more than enough. And this is why Elon Musk is saying 250 metric tons will be possible. I hope this helps you understand what we have to look forward to with Starship. Because once it starts flying, putting as much into orbit with one launch as two Saturn Vs, and that means habitats, nuclear engines, and ships to Mars. This will truly change everything about spaceflight. Something to think about. Thanks for listening and for your support on Patreon. We appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.